over there. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I want to thank, first of all, Herman Cain for that incredible introduction and for having the courage to come and to support me. There are lots of people when you run for office and you're challenging an incumbent who say quietly to you, I'm for you, but I can't say it publicly. Well, if you can't say it publicly, then you're probably really not for me in ways that are meaningful. And to have someone with the respect and the esteem, and somebody who tapped not just into the minds of grassroots, but the hearts of grassroots, say, I will stand up and say, I support you. Someone like Mr. Kane meant the world to me. So please give him another round of applause. I also am profoundly grateful to Chris and Becky for being willing to organize this. I met them once before. The fact that two people that I met once would be willing to put this together on very short notice and to sort of vouch for me with people who are important to them is really humbling and it's really gratifying. So thank you both for doing that. I'd also like to thank the Stangies for letting a fellow lawyer invade your <laughs> law firm. <laughs> there aren't that many conservative lawyers, so we share a bond, so thank you for that. I also want to thank each of you who, when you came to take a picture, you told me why it was important to you to be a conservative and to stay involved. I also loved the concept of hood conservatives because it, <laughs> it inspires this notion of being at the grassroots, but being at the grassroots where the people are. Not just talking the talk, but encouraging them to walk the walk. So thank you very much for being here. Yes. I also want to thank my father, who also serves as my campaign manager. <laughs> nothing more grassroots than having your family members be part of your campaign. <laughs> because you're sitting around your table thinking about, if someone said this, would it resonate with our family? We don't poll test everything. We talk about, does it make sense as a family? Because in many respects, we are doing this as a family. You rise as a family, you fall as a family. The things that people say about one person, they're saying about the whole family. And so if you don't have your family there supporting you, you can't do this. So I want you to give him a great big round of applause. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself, how I became a conservative, and why I'm crazy enough to want to go to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and I promise I won't go there and drink the water. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a very political family. I grew up in a family, though, that stressed hard work and good work ethics. We were taught that nothing's going to be handed to you, that if you want something, you have to be willing to work for it, and you have to give it your best. I actually became a conservative when I was a college student at the University of Illinois. Most people do not go to college and become a conservative. <laughs> <laughs> but it is possible. Yes, Illinois. In Illinois as well. But for me, I was studying political science and history, and I started reading our country's foundational documents for myself. I was reading the Constitution, and I fell in love with our Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, and the framework of our government. And it sounds cheesy, but there's an elegance and a power and a beauty with the way in which our founders constructed the Constitution and the way in which they put together our system of governance. And then when I started looking at the histories of countries where they centralized power, those were always the countries that were less prosperous. Those were always the countries where the people were less free. And then I started looking at the countries where they had the people at the forefront of the government. Those were the countries where people had the right incentives to start the businesses, to create the jobs, and to ultimately live out that American dream. And I wasn't setting out to find out what my political philosophy was, but I realized in that moment, I'm a conservative, and it just clicked. And I think sometimes if you don't grow up in a political family, you, the way you talk about politics isn't just the same way everyone talks about politics. You talk about it in ways that resonate with you and the ways in which it resonated for when you said, I'm a conservative, that aha moment. But the other part of my story, probably the reason that most intrigued you, is how does one then go to become Miss America? Because usually you don't go from being a conservative to say, OK, I'm going to become Miss America. I graduated from the University of Illinois, and I was looking to go on to law school. And my dream was to go to Harvard because it sounded like a place I could never imagine to go. And I had a great college advisor who said, if that's where you really want to go, you owe it to yourself to apply and see what happens. So I applied. 
and I got that acceptance box. I knew that it was a yes because they would not take an entire box to say no. And I was delighted until I opened up that tuition and saw that it was going to cost about $175,000 for three years. My parents didn't think I should go. They said, frame it, feel proud, and go to a school where you can get a scholarship. Because they made it clear they weren't paying for it, and I certainly didn't have the means of paying for it. But I had that same college advisor who said, if you really want to go and that's your dream, find a creative way of paying for it. So I had competed in a couple of pageants when I was in college to pay for tuition. So I was not on toddlers and tiaras as a child, here comes honey boo boo, none of that. But I thought, you know what? If I do this, perhaps I can earn the money to pay for school. So I told my parents, I said, I'm going to go to Harvard Law School, and my way of paying for it is I'm going to become Miss America this year. Like any, <laughs> like any good fiscal conservative parents, they said, so what's your backup plan? Because that's like saying, you're going to go play the lottery. <laughs> but I worked at it because I understood that if I did not succeed, I would be taking out $175,000 in loans. So I won a pageant in my area, became Miss Illinois, and ultimately became Miss America. So much of it had to do with God's providence because there were so many young women who want, had that same goal and that same ambition. But sometimes God's timing in terms of what he wants to accomplish through you and with you surpasses what you could imagine. And during the course of that year, I had the opportunity to take on a new type of leadership role. And one of the issues that I talked to young people about was bullying. It was an experience that I had when I was younger. I had to leave a school because I was the victim of harassment. And I understood what it was like to be marginalized. And so when I would go into those schools, I knew they were just looking for me to do the wave and talk about world peace. But I ended up, <laughs> well, you have to keep it real. You know what the stereotypes are. I ended up talking to young people about why they shouldn't end their life, why they should still have hope. Some of my favorite moments, though, were when young people would ask me questions about faith, because that was at the heart of who I was. I'll never forget, I spoke at a school once for abused and neglected young people. And at the end, this young man said, I mentioned nothing about faith. He said, could you end our assembly by singing Jesus Loves Me? And it was a way to share with young people who'd lost hope that there was still a plan for their life. After that year, I really felt a sense of wanting to make a difference because I recognized that if one person was willing to put themselves out there and step outside of their comfort zone, they really could make a difference. I did go on, graduated from Harvard Law School, debt free, which my dad was very <laughs> pleased with. <laughs> And part of my practice has actually involved Constitution. I've had the privilege of representing religious and not-for-profit groups on some of the First Amendment issues that they face. And so I'm passionate about the Constitution. And I'm also passionate about taking the Constitution to the next generation of young people who've never heard of it. I worked with a group that would go into schools and talk to young people about the Constitution. And usually you'd think, oh, that's boring. They're going to sit there. They're going to like take out their phones. But we started with the Fourth Amendment. We were talking to them about how the Fourth Amendment protects them. And it was novel to them because they'd never heard it before. And they said, what you're talking about? Has anyone ever written this stuff down? <laughs> Indeed. So it's called the Constitution. And then they said, could we have one? Like pocket constitutions for each and every one of you. But it again showed me that if we can talk about these principles in a way that's fresh and inspiring, we really can capture the hearts and minds of young people. I decided to run because I want to take that sense of constitutionalism back to governance. So often people's starting point for policy is what do they think is a good idea? No, the starting point is what does the Constitution say about it? The second question you ask is, is this even the role of the federal government to do it? If it's not, then whether you think it's a good idea or not is sort of irrelevant. And I want those to be the kind of questions that we ask more often. I'm also running because I very much want to change the way Illinois Republican politics works. If you know anything about this race, you know I'm challenging an incumbent, and you know the party has worked very hard to get me out of this race. They took a vote to deny me access to the voter vault and formalized a policy. They denied me the ability to speak at Republican Day, at the state fair, and just things that I think undermine the message that conservative principles really are attractive to all people. 
And I think that if you want to change the way the party system works, you have to be willing to challenge it, even if they're pushing back. And I'm sure as grassroots people, you know that if people tell you you can't do something, all of a sudden you say, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. And it galvanizes your volunteers. We have amazing volunteers throughout the district, people who are involved with politics for the first time and people who used to be involved and felt disenchanted but say, I feel like there's now somebody who's speaking my voice and sharing my message. And so there are just a couple of key things that I would want to accomplish in D.C. First of all, I would like us to be having a budget that is not $17.2 trillion, $17 trillion in debt. And the only way we can do that is by voting no on wasteful spending. The person I'm running against has voted yes on things that I think we cannot really justify. And regardless of how attractively named the bill is, if it's not something that's necessary, if it's not something that's constitutionally mandated, you have to be willing to vote no. I also want to make sure that our health care system is not being taken over by bureaucrats. Part of my legal practice, and, and you can vote, you can <laughs> applaud for that. I work in the medical field. So do I. As somebody who does some work in healthcare law, I see firsthand how these regulations curb innovation. They make small business owners decide, I have to make sure I don't get to that 50th employee. They make, you all know that, and they make a small business owner say, I need to make sure that nobody's working 30 hours. Let's cut everyone to 28. In a time in which people need jobs, so many young people need jobs, that is not the right kind of policy that encourages job growth. And I believe that bad laws should be replaced by good laws. And people like us have to be willing to stand up and say, there are things that we can do to improve the health care system that does not involve a federal takeover of our insurance system. Yes. But finally, I want to renew the sense that there's something worth achieving in Washington, D.C. Beyond politics and beyond the fatigue that people feel about politics, so many people just feel that there's no reason to be involved at all. They think it doesn't matter who I send, it doesn't matter what they've said, they're going to end up breaking their promise. And if you worked hard for them, it means that they're going to end up breaking your heart. You're going to feel like I worked to get that person there and they just voted the same way. Well, what I can tell you is I will be the same person that you see here tonight if I get to Washington, D.C. And I don't, okay, when I get to Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to be there for an entire career because I think we need to have term limits and we need to ensure that people are not there for their entirety of their lives and career. But I ultimately think people need to get back to the sense of service. That's what inspired our founding fathers. That's what made George Washington say, I'm not seeking that third term. And that's more importantly what makes people invest in their communities and their parties, that sense of service, that it's not about you, it's about a country that's bigger than you, it's about principles that inspire you, and it's about each and every one of us getting to be part of that great grand American experiment and being part of that more perfect union. So that's why I'm running, and I thank you again for being willing to come out and support somebody who's not even from your state, but who shares your heart and passion for the Constitution and grassroots. So thank you, and God bless.